Great. So hello and welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining me today, especially on, uh, well, at least it's over here in Scotland. It's quite a sunny Saturday. Um, so I appreciate you all spending this time with me. Now, today's class was going to be talking about the Eco-Gothic and the Anthropocene. Um, I am a recent graduate, just for a brief introduction about myself, I'm a recent graduate from the University of Stirling. So I graduated this past October with a Master of Letters in the Gothic Imagination. Um, and I currently work now, um, well, in my spare time, I, I work part time <laughs> just at a local supermarket, but I do research independently. Um, I hope to eventually study a PhD, but financial barriers right now are preventing me from doing that. So as Sam mentioned, I have a Kofi page. Uh, this is the best way to stay up to date with any of my research, if that interests you. Uh, in terms of conferences, I'll be presenting at any presentations like this. Um, and I'd greatly appreciate it if you guys gave that a we look after today's class. Um, and Again, alternatively, another way to keep up to date with what I'm talking about is uh, through my Twitter. I post a lot over there. Um, and if you have any questions following the class that you haven't had the chance to ask today, or if um, for the future people watching this recording, uh, my email is there to have any questions as well. So in terms of today's class, uh, as Sam mentioned it's broken down into three parts. So the first part we're going to be looking at the eco-gothic uh, and eco-horror. The second part is the Anthropocene and eco-feminism. And then the third part is really going to be focusing on contemporary female gothic. And there's going to be a wee, uh, textual analysis in that based on a, a recent novel that was published. So there are breaks uh, for between part one and two and then part two and three are 10 minutes long. Um, and again, I encourage you to ask any questions at those points that you have based on those parts, because there is quite a lot that we're getting through today. So with that being said, we're going to just jump straight on in. So the eco-gothic is commonly looked at in two separate ways. So it's either looked at as a genre or as a theoretical framework. Now, the majority of critics consider the eco-gothic in terms of the latter definition as a theoretical framework, and that's how I'll be addressing it today. So keeping that in mind, if you look at the book covers on screen, there are a variety of genres here from classic gothic texts such as Frankenstein, Dracula, to more contemporary texts of horror such as Tender is the Flesh, and things such as the old weird, the new weird, and very um, dystopian type texts as well, such as you see with Margaret Atwood. So there's a variety of genres here that are going on that we can apply this theoretical framework to. And we can see that from the, the longevity from the 1700s all the way up until the modern day, that there's clearly uh, a high interest in regards to the exploration of humanity's relationship with ecology and how this is particularly imagined in fiction. So nature has always played an important role in the Gothic. From the beginning, atmosphere has been a defining component. We see this in the prose of Anne Radcliffe with how she describes nature. Whether you love or hate that approach is uh, up for debate. <laughs> I'm personally in the love category. Uh, and this critical element progresses even further as nature moves beyond just setting, beyond an aesthetic, and becomes a character in and of itself. So Parker and Pollen argue that if one considers some of the giants of the Gothic canon in relation to Frankenstein, Dracula, the mysteries of Dolfu, the monk, etc., it quickly becomes clear that nature, in its various forms, is integral to the Gothic. Nature is essential to the Gothic, both in terms of where things take place and how things take place. That is to say, the natural world is both dominant as setting and as character. A fantastic example of this can be seen in the extract from Samuel Coldridge's poem here, The Rime of the Ancient Mariner. In case you haven't read it, the poem is about a mariner who uh, brings a curse onto his crew uh, after he shoots an albatross. It's only when he understands and respects the surrounding nature uh, and environment that he is able to make it ashore. However, he's cursed as the only survivor to plague the land, repeating the same story as a warning to others. The extract on the uh, slide shown here demonstrates the aliveness of the environment in this particular poem, which I will read 
just now. I sorry. I, oh no. Sorry, I'm trying to find my Wii mouse. There we go, because all of the people are blocking it. <laughs> so the poem reads, and the coming wind did roar more loud, and the sails did sigh like sedge, and the rain poured down from one black cloud, the moon was at its edge. The thick black cloud was cleft and still, the moon was at its side, like water shot from some high crag, the lightning fell with never a jag, a river steep and wide. The loud wind never reached the ship, yet now the ship moved on. Beneath the lightning and the moon, the dead men gave a groan. The environment here, the moon, the sea, the lightning, is more than just a setting where the story takes place. It's an emotive and responsive character that drives the story and is arguably the true protagonist of this tale. There is a fascination present here in the fear of nature as um, an awful power. Uh, and this is especially true in depictions of storms uh, that feature heavily in many Gothic texts. Just think of Frankenstein's Mary Shelley, for example, oh, Frankenstein's Mary Shelley, <laughs> Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and Victor's reaction to the lightning striking an old oak into oblivion. Victor declares, I never beheld anything so utterly destroyed. And it is this destructive power that ignites the imagination that fascinates and horrifies us a horror that you cannot peel your eyes away from. And this becomes even more prominent with the emergence of eco-horror. So I wanted to begin with eco-horror because I think it's quite important in relation to how we come to the point of the eco-Gothic. So eco-horror is a much older and more established term than the eco-Gothic. These are not interchangeable terms, although people do erroneously use it that way. Unlike the eco-gothic, eco-horror is generally interpreted as a genre label, as a type of horror fiction used to describe texts in which nature fights back and in which there is a distinct environmental message uh, which seeks to raise awareness and even incite action. So if you think, if you hear the, the term eco-horror, you typically have an idea of what you can expect. Now this emerged alongside the Cold War uh, in the mid 1900s and its nuclear warfare, which created an anxiety not only for humanity itself, but for the lasting repercussions of such technology on the planet, specifically for the non-humans. The photo of, on this slide really drives this point home because this is actually a photo from a testing site from a nuclear missile test. And you can see here that the, the aftermath of this, this nuclear missile literally le leaves a gaping wound into the earth, a gunshot that literally stains the surface and is unlike anything anybody had seen previously. So this really is something out of a horror story made real and the eco um, horror really boomed during this time. Um, and this is especially in relation to the effects on the non-human with the emergence of these creature features. Um, so specifically films with a plot where uh, animals uh, are seeking revenge on humanity um, for our abusive and destructive behavior towards them. Now an infamous example of an eco-horror feature, uh, a creature feature is none other than Hitchcock's The Birds. So The Birds was released in 1963 and directed by Alfred Hitchcock. The film was inspired by a short story written by Daphne du Maurier uh, under the same name, and that was published just over a decade before the film's release. Uh, it was also inspired by real life events that happened in a California bay where uh, seabirds essentially ingested toxins through their food and uh, started behaving very radically and actually were dive bombing into the residential houses. So these residents woke up and looked outside their homes and there were literally birds just scattered across the ground, either exhausted and dying or already dead. Now the film takes this idea of the birds attacking humans and examines the reason why something like this could ever happen. 
And this is questioned brilliantly in the iconic film trailer, which we'll watch now. It's a trailer that's laced with dark humor and emphasizes the perceived inevitability of revenge from, uh, from non-human creatures towards humans because of humanity's exploitative behaviors. So we'll go ahead and just give a watch of that now. As you can see from that trailer, um, there it's literally dripping in sarcasm. Uh, it, it's very blatant what exactly Hitchcock is playing at. And that's the fact that clearly because of the way that humans are treating uh, non-humans, that eventually something's going to reach a breaking point and there's going to be a flip. And that flip in the film, of course, is the birds beginning to attack. And it really makes us question who the real monsters are. And it's this exploration of the darker realities of humanity's relationship with nature that gives rise to the eco-Gothic. So the eco-Gothic is a relatively new area of study. Uh, and it was first, um, the first publication that was dedicated solely to it was only published in 2013. So that's less than a decade ago. Uh, and this volume is titled simply Eco-Gothic and is edited by Andrew Smith and William Hughes. And it's the first to explore the Gothic through the theories of eco-criticism. And this is the defining aspect of the eco-Gothic. It takes an eco-critical lens and applies these theories of eco-criticism alongside the theories of the Gothic, examining both old and new Gothic texts. Although I would of course argue that it is definitely not limited to the realm of the Gothic. Following the publication of Eco-Gothic, a special volume in the journal Gothic Studies was entirely devoted to this new theory. And the interest in the Eco-Gothic continued to grow from there at an incredibly fast pace to become what I would argue is an integral part of contemporary Gothic discourse. And there are two people who have specifically been dubbed the godfathers of the Eco-Gothic, and they are Simon Estock and Tom Hillard. In 2009, Estock published an article titled Theorizing uh, in a Space of Ambivalent Openness, Eco-Criticism eco and Ecophobia, in which he outlined his hypotheses of ecophobia, arguing that humans view nature as both threatening and vengeful. This was quickly fo followed by an article titled Into That Darkness Peering, an essay on Gothic nature, written in Hillard in the same year as Estock's article and pretty much responding to that. So Hillard was the first person who really made the link between ecophobia and the Gothic and was really considering how eco-critical theory, specifically this negative perspective, um, how this could bring new insight to the field of study for the Gothic. In fact, this term is still so new that there's not really a consensus on how it should be written. <laughs> so I have at the bottom of this slide here a few examples of how you might see the word um, printed in various areas. Now, I personally use the format of a capitalized G, but really that comes down to just personal preference. But in order to talk about the eco-Gothic, it's quite crucial for us to understand what ecophobia is, because this is really what ignited the entire field of study, whether you agree with it or not is an entirely different story, but it is integral to how we've come to the point we're at today. So what is ecophobia and why is it so important to the Gothic? Well, as previously mentioned, it was coined by Simon C. Estock and it's defined as an irrational and groundless hatred, which is often uh, depicted as fear of the natural world that is as present and subtle in our daily lives and literature as homophobia and racism and sexism. Quite a bold claim. Now, crucially, in approaching this theory, Estock aimed to explore the relationship between humanity and nature more along the lines of uh, Timothy Morton's dark ecology. I don't have time to go into that today, but essentially that's uh, just a, ne uh, a negative perspective of the human and nature relationship. So that's what Estock is really building on. And he wanted to move away from the positive relationship that eco-criticism had largely focused on. So instead, ecophobia really called for more research into these darker depictions, which naturally led to the idea of the Gothic. 
although it should be said that Simon Estock in his original publication doesn't mention the Gothic in any shape or form, but he has become part of the discourse, um, writing articles in academic journals such as the Gothic Nature. But why do we have ecophobia? Why is it so important? And it's important to the Gothic because this is what the Gothic really plays on. Of course, it plays on our fears and anxieties. And we can see the darker representations in the environment of the Gothic, where a language of estrangement rather than belonging has manifested between human and ecology, especially in regards to the post radcliffian era, which saw a more ecologically aware society, which we'll talk about in a bit. Now, Estock argues that the ecophobia hypothesis seeks an understanding of these irrational fears of nature and natural things and how these fears pattern relationships that are very destructive to our environment. The aforema aforementioned estrangement is commonly rooted in these irrational fears as humans have become more and more dissociated from nature. Instead of employing a binary categorization of human versus non-human, human, human versus the other. Nature is viewed as the ultimate opponent, further perpetuating this idea that the environment is something to be feared, something to be conquered. And this only acts as justification to our continued exploitation and abuse of the environment because it is something that we see as an opponent for our own survival um, and something that is very fearful. Uh, it also d helps us uh, diminish humanity's ecological responsibilities. If we fear something, we don't necessarily feel bad when we're destroying it. As the ecophobia hypothesis points out, it isn't just fear, but also hatred for something that humanity can never fully control, for something we are fundamentally dependent on. And so after all that, we finally come to, again, what is this eco-Gothic? And it is a, um, it really calls attention to the overlooked role that ecology plays in Gothic literature. Uh, and again, this is not limited to contemporary Gothic, but harks back to the Romantic Gothic. And by that, I mean Gothic literature from the Romanticism era and the origins of this ecologically aware society that we particularly see with Anne Radcliffe. Now, ultimately, this is a way of interrogating and interpreting our increasingly troubled relationship with nature. One of the best definitions I've come across in terms of the eco-Gothic is from David Del Principe, who argues that the eco-Gothic examines the construction of the body, um, of the Gothic body, unhuman, non-human, transhuman, post-human, or hybrid, through a more inclusive lens, asking how it can be more meaningfully understood as a site of articulation for environmental and species identity. So hopefully by now you have a bit of an idea of why exactly the Gothic plays such a crucial role in this um, and how this is really the ideal setting or space rather for this exploration of the darker realities. The very foundations of the Gothic lie in the traversal of boundaries um, much of the fear and desire that saturates the Gothic stems from the blurring of distinctions and the destruction of dualisms between what we deem wholly human and wholly nature. As previously mentioned, it is this binary categorization that enables destructive treatment towards the environment by humans. And so, in theorizing about menace, the eco-Gothic allows for the understanding of how we imagine and persecute social and environmental otherness about how monstrosity is central to an environmental imagination that locates the human as a center of all things good and safe. There is a growing current of eco-anxiety creating monstrous visions mirroring our, our fears about the fate of our civilization and the planet we call home. And this anxiety, this inevitable fear, is why Estoc argues that ecophobia is central to the eco-gothic claiming no ecophobia, no eco-gothic. Now, I, I will say this is a very bold statement for him to, to claim, and I'm not entirely sure that I agree with that, but there will be much more on that later, um, specifically in the third part. 
So the Gothic has always been political and transgressive, and this makes for the ideal space for these eco-Gothic narratives, which transform memory into imagination and articulate what often cannot be expressed in other forms under conditions of cultural erasure. The Gothic gives a voice to these socio-political issues and forces us to come to term with the fear and discomfort that we have long ignored. The reality of our consequences for what we've done to our planet. Now, just in summary of how we've gotten to this point today. So we started off previously, even before the mid 1900s um, with just the idea of nature in the Gothic, just in exploring these darker realities through uh, Gothic fiction. In mid 1900s, we have the establishment of eco horror as um, cinema features these violent, specifically non-human creatures uh, in their plots. In 2004, there's Timothy Morton's work uh, on the critical theory of dark ecology, again, really examining this darker relationship between humans and non-humans. 2009, we have saw Iman C. S. Stock outlining the definition of ecophobia. Uh, followed by Tom Hillard's publication of the essay on Gothic nature. And those are the really two um, crucial uh, articles in relation to how we then get to the eco-Gothic in 2013. And then again, that's followed with uh, the Gothic studies in 2014. And it just really continued to thrive from there. But my question is, why now? Why, why did it appear in 2013 specifically? And under a bit of research, it shows that this uh, idea of the eco-Gothic emerged several years before countries started to declare a climate emergency. And this is a direct result of heightening eco-anxieties among populations around the world, as the damage we've done becomes more and more um, prominent in our day-to-day -day lives and can no longer be overlooked. And in fact, now it's quite rare to attend a Gothic conference, for example, without at least one panel being dedicated to the eco-Gothic. So you can really see here how it's transformed rapidly over a space of short time to become such a, a strong component within contemporary Gothic discourse. Uh, and, you know, we have entire journals now that are associated specifically to it. And um, one particular example that I wanted to give a shout out to is the uh, open access online journal, which many of you might have heard of called Gothic Nature, which is available at gothicnaturejournal.com. Again, completely open access, and it's absolutely fantastic. There's uh, recent articles published both by Estock and Hillard in there as well, kind of looking back at how they've uh, contributed to the specific theoretical framework. So the question remains as to what is next for the eco-Gothic? Where do we go from here? And that's what I want to explore in the second part of this um, class today. And that's going to be on the Anthropocene. So at this point, I suggest you all take a 10 minute break. <laughs> um, you can ask me any questions you have at this point. Uh, again, it says 10 minutes here. We can probably do up to 15 minutes if people have a lot of questions, because again, I know that I spat out quite a bit of theory just now. Um, so yeah, if you would like, Sam, you can stop recording at this point, I guess, because the question you are free to do so. Right, so I want to begin this next um, part of today's class with a clip from a BBC documentary that recently came out uh, just last year, I think it was, titled Extinction the facts, you might have seen it yourselves. Uh, there is a content warning for this clip coming up uh, and that's for uh, some images viewers might find distressing, particularly in relation to animal cruelty. This uh, is from one minute 27 to one minute 47. I'll hold up my hand during this time to alert you to the content warning uh, and I'll put my hand down when that's over. The audio does remove a majority of the distressing nature, uh, although there is a gunshot that can be heard, but hopefully um, that means you can just kind of hide your screen and it, even by having the audio on uh, it should be okay for you so we're going to just go ahead and watch this now 
the relationship between humans and the environment is a deeply troubled one. Uh, and it's not only impacting humanity itself, but the planet and all of its inhabitants. Uh, this is not news for anybody, I'm sure. And a quote that I found particularly impactful from this was that today we are the asteroid. Over the course of- There we go. So now we come to the Anthropocene and this is where I get a bit more excited. <laughs> um, so the Anthropocene was originally coined in the 1980s by ecologist Eugene Stomer and was popularized uh, at the inception of the 21st century by Nobel Prize winning atmospheric chemist Paul Crutzen. Uh, and Crutzen was uh, who, Crutzen won the Nobel Peace Prize in chemistry in 1995 for their work in the atmospheric chemistry, particularly concerning the formation and decomposition of the ozone. And it is this decomposition of the ozone that humanities have overwhelmingly negatively contributed to. So what exactly is the Anthropocene? Well, the Anthropocene is the designated new epoch of geological time that we are currently in which is dominated by human impact on the earth. And this is to succeed the Holocene from the mid 20th century. Now, the Holocene is uh, described as having begun at the end of the last ice age. So essentially it's um, moving us on from that particular um, moment in time. So as Ellis argues, humans have so clearly reshaped the earth since then. And this reshaping has been, again, overwhelmingly negative. Now it's generally accepted that the Anthropocene itself started in the uh, mid 1700s with the industrial revolution when large scale factories were introduced and mass production became a reality, transforming not only our economies, but our lifestyle. Um, However, there's still a lot of contention of exactly where the Anthropocene starts, uh, during what time it starts. But again, largely uh, what people kind of agree on is the Industrial Revolution, because that is when the carbon footprint from humanity skyrockets, or at least begins to skyrocket. And to understand the Anthropocene, we have to understand the anthropocentric mind. So the term Anthropocene is rooted in the idea of anthropocentrism, which is the belief that humans are the most important component of life and are superior to non-humans. And it's this belief that perpetuates humanity's entitled perception um, of non-humans, both animals and the environment, existing solely as objects for human consumption. We can see this in the way of thinking that is dominant in um, the Western um, world and the Western religion of Christianity. I shouldn't say just Western Christianity, it is the religion as a whole in Christianity. Um, in the book of Genesis, God declares that the fear and dread of humanity shall rest on every animal of the earth. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And just as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. And this explicitly asserts that the planets and all its inhabitants exist purely for the needs and desires of humans. That being said, even outside of religious um, connotations, anthropocentrism is not inevitable or unavoidable. As argued by Uat, the human perspective that comes from being human is unavoidable, of course. But the content of moral and political frameworks rooted in anthropocentric belief, such as the belief that we are the most important thing to exist, is not inevitable. It is a construction of the society in which we live. And it's important to note that the Anthropocene is actually a controversial term for many, um, as it argues that it um, erases the role played by colonialism and capitalism as the actual driving forces behind climate change. Instead, this idea of the Anthropocene groups all humans together and places the victim, uh, places the blame equally on all of humanity as a victim, as, um, as a cause for this crisis. 
But this simply doesn't address the reality of the problem. As argued by Ellis, people have never transformed Earth equally. The wealthiest humans in the wealthiest societies are the main cause of rapid global climate change. And with that, we come to one of the main research topics that I focus on, which is ecofeminism. So ecofeminism, uh, it was coined in the early 1970s by French activist Francois Dauban. And uh, the core principle of ecofeminism is that all humans and non-human entities are regarded as equal, thus disputing anthropocentrism. Instead of an anthropocentric approach, it, it takes an ecocentric approach. Ecofeminism argues that the patriarchal dominance over feminine characteristics such as reproduction and fertility has led to the oppression of both women and nature because they are seen as exploitable resources. Dubois does not view patriarchy and capitalism as separate realities, but rather, as uh, Roth Johnson explains, capitalism is simply the newest manif manifestation of patriarchy and its last phase. Through the lens of ecofeminism, the patriarchy is responsible for both ecological disasters due to overproduction and capitalistic logic and the enslavement of women in taking over women's bodies. Therefore, the problem is not only anthropocentric, but androcentric. Androcentric being the belief that man specifically is the most superior and important being of all life. Thus, it goes one step further than anthropocentrism in terms of putting man as the highest being. Thus, ecofeminism proposes that to resolve the ecological crisis we are in, the liberation of women must be addressed alongside the environment. So this is where we can see that there is an argument to be made about where exactly the Anthropocene begins. And in terms of ecofeminism, it would be argued that the Anthropocene doesn't lie in the beginnings of industrial revolution, but with the very beginnings of agriculture. As Princip argues, the commodification of animals caused by a pragmatic breach um, in our relationship with animals. And of course, humans are also animals and are also biological. The way in which we treat human life keeps open the crucial space for this kind of biopolitics to proceed among humans. And we can see this imagined in novels such as The Marrow Thieves, by author Cherie de Maline, in which indigenous people are harvested for their bone marrow to supply the predominantly white population, and in Tenders the Flesh by Augustina Basterica, a novel set in a future where a disease infected animals, leading to the cull of all creatures to an extent, and the normalization of cannibalism through the breeding of human livestock. Livestock that, although human, are not considered to be wholly human. These are terrifying stories that are horrific because the way that the authors tell these tales show us that these don't necessarily seem that far off. They're somewhat plausible. Even if they're um, based in a lot of fantasy, the, the core text of the matter still remains a reality for many. They touch on the very real issues in our societies, whether that be the genocide of Indigenous people and the erasure of Indigenous culture, or the way we manufacture and produce our meat. And the horror of these stories, this space for biopolitics among humans, is not something that is restricted to the boundaries of fiction. We see it happening in our everyday lives. As Estoc points out, it is the most vulnerable in society, including women, indigenous people, developing countries, queer communities, and non-animals, as well as the poor, ex uh, sick, etc., who are disproportionately impacted by the consequences of climate change. Additionally, there are groups of people, uh, these are the groups of people that are typically contributing the least to climate change with the lowest carbon emissions. Now, an example that demonstrates how privilege pay, plays out in terms of the client crisis 
features none other than Kim Kardashian, which is probably not a name you thought you would be hearing when we're talking about the Gothic, but there you go. <laughs> um, now, during the California wildfires of 2018, Kim Kardashian hired private firefighters to prevent her house and her entire street from being destroyed by the flames. Now, the reason I mention this is because Kim Kardashian is part of the 1% of society who arguably have the largest individual carbon footprints and subsequently the biggest individual impact on climate change. And she was able to escape the consequences of her high consuming, high pollution lifestyle because she had the money to divert those quote costs. So it's not those who have the largest carbon footprint who will fear the the brunt of the true severity of climate crisis first. It is going to be the most vulnerable. And we already see that in places um, such in South Africa, where there are literally communities that have to um, move to different areas due to drought and um, uh, crop failure and things like this. But nobody's really paying attention because it's not here. And we've seen the effects of this disproportionate impact with the COVID-19 crisis that we're going through right now, with the increased risk of severe illness or death in ethnic minorities and specifically disabled people. In the UK, six out of 10 people who died from COVID-19 were disabled. And Ewan argues that this really comes down to the fact that who counts as a human at any particular moment is in and of itself a byproduct of political life. And we heard it a lot during this pandemic doctors having to choose who to save and who to let die. There is already a detachment happening with the COVID-19 crisis here in the UK, because as we slowly and cautiously return to normalcy, there are literally thousands of bodies burning on funeral pyres in India. I mean, it took the world long enough to help out India. And you can see that through societal pressures, that is why then aid is being sent over. And we need to be acting more quickly in regards to this because we need to be working on this together. And during this pandemic, many have spoken of how our reality has become gothicized, like something out of a horror film. But the truth of the matter is that our reality, our relationship with the environment and with nature has always been gothic because of the binary categorizations that we've placed on it, this idea that we are human and it is other. So in terms of the eco-Gothic and eco-feminism, we can really see that this is an ideal marriage of theories. The Gothic often portrays this estrangement between humans and non-humans in panicked dystopian terms as humans' reluctance to come to terms with their non-human ancestry and the common biological origins of all life. And thus, nature becomes constituted in the Gothic as a space of crisis, where narratives of haunted histories are brought into the spotlight and, question, um, the, and the question of monstrosity is turned inwards as we are forced to ask ourselves, who are the real monsters of the Anthropocene? And the Gothic is an ideal space for this discussion because of its use of the monstrous figure um, to uh, the use of the monstrous to figure these repressed histories, particularly those histories of oppressed and vulnerable minorities. And again, in these in the text, um, the aforementioned text of the Meryl Thieves and Tenders the Flesh, it's actually not nature that is terrifying in and of itself, but rather the human behavior taken both previous to the disastrous effects. So the behavior that got us into the problem in, uh, from the beginning, and also how we address and solve these um, problems. Because these, pro uh, these solutions are typically done with the aim to maintain the status quo, prioritizing the economy above all else, and thus a capitalistic anthropocentric societal structure. So it really comes back again to this idea that by calling this the Anthropocene, we are 
um, the, the people who are making the biggest impact on climate change are kind of getting out scot-free in a sense. Um, they're able to define the language that we're using. Um, they're able to define how we feel about what's happening around us. And they are, it, it, it's not necessarily a diverse uh, picture of what exactly is happening to the planet. So this is actually quite a brief part. I'm not sure how long I've gone on for, but I hope it was actually brief because the third part is the longest part of the discussion today. Um, so we have come to another short break. Uh, please do ask questions. I hope that you have questions in regards to this. Um, and Sam, you can stop recording if you would like. So you can, oh, you've already started to record, perfect. Uh, I thought the best way to start off the final section of the class today is with a clip from none other than Moana. So um, I think this clip perfectly captures the heart of ecofeminism. Um, I, will, I will give a content warning here, uh, just in terms of there is a underlying tone uh, that could be connected with sexual assault. So um, that's for the entire clip here which is roughly about three and a half minutes. So just as a, as a warning for anybody who might need that. But that being said, let's play the clip. It really sums up the idea of ecofeminism. And if I can use more, you know, colloquial language, it's big ecofeminist energy <laughs> coming from this, this film. Um, and it really shows this shared gendered reality between women and nature, uh, specifically at the hands of men. Now, feminism is imperative to better understand 21st century society, particularly the rapidity and severity of the current um, climate crisis alongside the emergence of fourth wave feminism. Uh, so, you know, women's rights are seemingly under constant attack by a patriarchal culture that seeks to reclaim absolute control over the female body, uh, a counteraction to the loss of control over nature as the environment becomes increasingly unpredictable. And we can see the response um, taken against these attempts to reclaim the feminine bodies alongside cries for environmental awareness and change with events such as the Women's March protests, the Me, Me, the Me Too movement, the United States withdrawal and then renewal of the Paris Agreement, school strikes for climate, protests and strikes against abortion bans, and the most recently um, the revival of Reclaim the Night protests. There's clearly a shared gendered experience of subjugation and oppression for both women and nature rooted in an anthropocentric and androcentric belief that views these other bodies as exploitable resources, objects to be used and then discarded by mankind. And we can see this connection being made from the very onset of feminism that began with a critique of nature, a critique of the idea that gender differences were bio biological, that gender was natural. And in my own research, I challenged the definition of feminine by considering the theory of ecofeminism and its ecocentric approach to humans and non-humans. I emphasize the fact that the idea of femininity is a socially constructed one. And I explore how this idea is not limited to the confinements of the female body. There is erroneous notion of femininity being solely equated to the female and masculinity to the male a binary categorization that I aim to deconstruct. Instead, I argue for a feminine corporeality, body, that highlights the organic fluidity of humans and non-humans, that demonstrates fear lies not in the environment itself, but in a material fear of the consequences of anthropocentric and androcentric beliefs. I examine this beyond human boundaries and consider the uncanny queering of so-called feminine bodies, both human and non-human, that are labeled as such because they exist in opposition to a heteronormative, androcentric, and anthropocentric society. Anyone who exists outside of these social constructs 
queers these normative expectations and is thus categorized as other. And so, as Phillips claims, there is an effort here to resist the ways which women in nature are linguistically, historically, and sexually confined, and most importantly, aims to undo binary hierarchies. Now, in terms of ecofeminism and the contemporary female Gothic, the female Gothic has largely moved beyond the original confinements of the domestic space that was crucial to its early inception when it was first coined by Ellen Moores in the mid 1970s. Now the female Gothic reflects a wider scope of experience that is influenced by the politics of a patriarchal culture. Wallace and Smith point out that the female Gothic is and always has been a politically subversive genre. It challenges the normative beliefs of the patriarchy and gives voice to the dissatisfactions, fears, and anxieties of women who are oppressed within patriarchal society. The material body must then be embraced to deconstruct the androcentric association of the masculine, rational mind as being superior to the feminine, emotive body. It is this binary categorization of mind versus body that continues to enable patriarchal culture to deem feminine bodies as other and thus inferior. And we can see how these anxieties um, of the feminine bodies are ever present in contemporary female Gothic texts. These are texts that challenge these anthropocentric and androcentric perspectives of humanity's relationship with nature. And I must say that this is, of course, not limited solely to women writers. That is probably a misconception when we're talking about ecofeminism and eco-Gothic. It's not limited to, to women writers. So an example I have here of um, an author who explores these types of ideas is Jeff Vandermeer. Um, you, if you've heard of him, you've probably heard of him in regards to the Southern Reach trilogy, is the first title of that series being uh, Annihilation. Uh, and instead of fearing the environments, these feminine bodies fear something far more monstrous. Um, so what I want to do now is take a look at a textual example um, in terms of how we can apply uh, an eco-feminist, eco-Gothic lens to contemporary works of the female Gothic. So the text that I want to look at just now is the Essex Serpent, but I'm glad I see an applause from Sam. <laughs> um, so this, um, yeah, so I just want to preface this by saying that the next few slides have actually been adapted from a dissertation chapter, which I explored um, this novel in a lot more depth. So if you have any questions in particular about this, please do feel free to ask them. So The Essex Serpent was published in 2016 uh, by Sarah Perry and is set in the late 19th century and tells the story of a recently widowed woman, Cora Seaborn, who moves from London to Essex um, in the countryside. Now Cora is enraptured by the local folklore of a monstrous serpent with eyes like sheep that lurks within the Essex waters. And this actually, um, the plot is based on or inspired by the real folklore uh, in Essex in which uh, there was a pamphlet that Perry came across in her research from 1669 uh, titled um, uh, Strange News Out of Essex. And what you see in the image of this slide here is a picture from the original pamphlet of that. So in this story, in her quest to find this creature, Cora befriends the small town's vicar, William Ransom, and his family. And despite the vast differences held by these two characters, they are drawn together. So the novel begins with the death of Cora Seaborn's husband, Michael Seaborn, who is an abusive and controlling man. This is a man who muses, what a thing it would be to have me break you and mend your wounds with gold. This statement reflects the ecofeminist idea that the masculine desire for control and exploitation of natural resources extends to the female body. Cora's body is not only seen in terms of its potential quantifiable value, her broken body is examined as an opportunity for profit and capitalistic gain. 
The imagery of bodily wounds filled with gold emphasizes the commoditized corporeal existence of the feminine. As argued by Phillips, this shows a world where body and nature are increasingly commodified, commoditized, and consumed. Furthermore, Cora claims that Michael would have paved over every bit of woodland, have every sparrow mounted on a plinth, and he had me mounted on a plinth. She becomes nothing but a possession, a resource to be exploited. Within the framework of ecofeminist theory, the treatment of Cora by her husband reflects the othering of the feminine by the patriarchy to establish mastery over those deemed inferior. Michael eradicates the familiarity between the masculine and feminine body, and it's important to note here too that Cora is consistently described throughout this novel as being very masculine in in her structure, in her attitude, in her um, in her in her behaviors. So, in terms of comparing Cora's body to the sparrows mounted on plinths. And it's an analogy that points out the shared consequences of capitalistic logic on both the environment and these feminized bodies. And in feminized, I mean that they are being feminized to place them as other to the male. So therefore, the death of Cora's husband is a transformative moment in Cora's life from wife to widow. It presents her with new opportunities because she finds herself free from the oppressive constraints that were imposed on her by Michael. Cora is finally, as she quotes herself, free to sink back into the earth, to let herself grow over with moss and lichen. lichen. And the fundamental source of ecophobia in this text is none other than the Essex serpent, which lives in the Essex Blackwater. In true eco-Gothic form, this creature blurs the boundaries between humans and non-humans. The first time the reader is confronted with the Essex serpent, the figure turns out not to be the creature at all. Instead, we are, uh, what we are led to believe is the monster turns out to be none other than William Ransom, who is described as a dark misshapen creature moving slowly making a low sound in the depths of its throat. It did not creep, but stood on hind legs. It almost had the shape of a man. And of course, it had the shape of a man because it was a man. <laughs> um, so the distortion of Will's body invokes fear in its potential threat of violence. Will's direct association here to the monstrous fear-invoking Essex serpent foreshadows the anxieties experienced by feminine bodies, particularly Cora. So despite Cora's escape from her oppressive husband, the safety and renewal of self that she experiences through her connection with the earth is threatened by persistent male desire for sexual consumption of her body. Initially, Cora lapses into a false sense of security because she believes Will showed a complete failure to notice she was a woman, thus proving he viewed her only as a mind, not a body. By focusing on the power of the mind over the body, Cora appeals to the masculine ideas that we've already discussed in terms of logic and rationality, a critical component of the consciousness of the patriarchy that systemically deprives other bodies um, in order to justify masculine domination. Will's bodily desires is explicitly shown in his desperation to remove an image of the serpent that rests on one of the chapel's pews. As Will attempts to chisel the figure away, he imagines the black water parting, and there on the mud, Cora standing sternly, and behind her with its heart beating, behind its wet skin, the Essex serpent, he filed off a winking eye. Now the masculine symbolism of the one-eyed serpent, a uh, euphemism for male genitalia, is impossible to ignore here. <laughs> it's literally staring us right in the face. Um, so the female body is both dominated and blurred by the towering figure of this serpent. Its monstrous desire becomes focused on Cora as it illustrates a yearning for sexual conquest. Cora's mind is no longer the domineering attribute in the eyes of Will because her, her female body is firmly identified in the logic of patriarchy as the other in respect to the male. And it is this masculine desire for dominance that provokes both terror and horror. 
and arguably the most significant moment of horror in this novel is the death of the creature, believed to be the Essex serpent, which is described in similar terms to a beached whale. Perry emphasizes the disconnect between men and the environment through the fearful, disgusted reactions that the male characters exhibit when the creature's purification reaches its climax. If you're a bit squeamish, you might just want to click out for a moment while I read this quote. The belly opened up along the seam and spilled out a pale and withering mass. The stench was unbearable. Each staggered back as if struck by a blow and Banks could not prevent himself from running to the Leviathan's bones and vomiting. Will did take a look, reeling a little. These reactions are directly contrasted by one of the women who, indifferent to the sight, stirred at the glistening mess with her foot and said, tapeworm, look at it yards long and still hungry. The imagery here is one of abject horror, which is described as the tangibly grotesque, consisting of corpses, decay, bodily fluids, etc. Elements of the body that are outwardly expelled and acts as reminders of humanity's animalistic origins. The experience of horror evoked from abjection is elaborated through the failure to recognize kin. Nothing is familiar not even a shadow of memory. And when faced with the horrific reality of the creature's demise, Will questions what was the creator thinking of to come up with so revolting a creature, which moreover lived off of the life of others. Now this implicit monstrous association between, between the tapeworm and male dominance highlights Will's ignorance and refusal to acknowledge the consequences of the Anthropocene. Like the tapeworm, mankind has consumed the earth from the inside out, destroying the environment from crust to ozone. Enforcing Will to confront this reality, his fear heightens as he struggles against humanity's connection to the non-human. Unlike the indifferent women who witness the same scene and can relate to such bodily horrors because they share the experiences of abuse and exploitation. Will cannot acknowledge his role in this maltreatment because he refuses to accept his kinship to the non-human, to the other. By, remo by removing the physical ambiguity of the Essex serpent, Perry echoes a classic Radcliffian reveal of a seemingly monstrous supernatural entity as nothing more than reality disguised by fear. Like the monsters of Radcliffe's Gothic novels, the fear produced by the Essex serpent points out an all too human monstrosity that is not based in the human beast of the 19th century novel, but in a Machiavellian tyrant patriarch. Thus the Essex serpent demonstrates the importance of embracing the material, the materiality of our bodies and acknowledging that we are organic beings embedded in ecology because this is how we can overcome our alienation and estrangement from nature. And it is this message of hope, of, of, be, of being able to move and overcome this alienation and estrangement that is crucial to the eco-Gothic. It's not just all doom and gloom. As argued by Hillard, literature matters because it both reflects and shapes values in the real world outside of literary texts. And the eco-Gothic shows the significance of writing creatively in bringing attention to current socio-political issues and arguably climate change is one of the most pressing issues of our time. Despite the dark nature of the Gothic tale, these novels inspire hope too. They provide an outlook of hope if only humanity can embrace our embedded organic materiality with all of life on earth. As Estoc argues, we labor under the delusion that theory is incompatible with praxis, that theory cannot lead to changes in public policy, but it can and it must. And I do hope that today in the class that I've given, I've combined some of this activism that Estoc believes is lacking in eco-critical theory. And a fantastic example of this concept of um, changing how we approach these problems can be seen in something called the Anthropocene feminism, which again, I'm not going to go into too much today because I'm only in the um, initial stages of researching it. 
but it highlights how feminism and queer theory offer alternatives to the unquestioned masculinist and technomative climate change solutions, solutions that maintain our current um, anthropocentric ideals, and they simply cannot be the only option because they are not good enough. So we need more people to acknowledge and believe in a balanced and sustained world, people are, who are willing to work towards change. Sorry. <coughs> Take a sip of water. Right. Um, and to do this, we must work together. And we must work together for the benefit of everyone. Nobody can be left behind. So on that note, I will wrap up today's class with some steps that we can take towards a better future. And I'm going to let none other than David Attenborough tell you the ways that you can do that. So again, there is a content warning for the next clip that I'm playing for any uh, images that people might find distressing. Again, particularly in relation to uh, meat production. Um, I, oh dear, sorry, I've just realized I've not actually marked the actual timing of this. So I will try to do a content warning the absolute best I can in terms of holding up my hand. But if you want to just completely miss the clip at this moment in time, that's understandable. And I can only apologize. I forgot to include the specific timestamp for myself. Um, and this is actually the second part of the clip that I showed earlier today. But before moving on to that, I just want to call attention to the slide here. And here we can see some people who really fall under this category of eco-feminists and who, who really take an eco-centric approach into um, environmental, um, uh, in, environmental activism. So of course we have David Attenborough, we've got Jane Goodall, there's Greta Thunberg and also Naomi Klein, who really focuses on the effects of capitalism in terms of how our society has played out. So let's listen to David Attenborough, shall we? It's a good way to end a presentation. He has such a soothing voice. Over the course of my life. Um, so yes, that is uh, in conclusion for today's class. I hope that was inspiring um, to listen to, gave you lots to think about. These are just some of the references that I have quoted during today's class. And I wanted to leave you with some recommended readings in case anybody's interested um, in looking at these topics further. So these are the handful of ones that I would suggest to get you started. So there's Anthropocene, a very short introduction. That's very good if you want to really know the scientific components behind the Anthropocene um, and what it means in terms of the geology of the earth. Uh, the Ecophobia Hypothesis by Estoc is a great summary of what exactly the Ecophobia is. Uh, obviously, I would recommend Ecogothic by uh, Smith and Hughes. And um, there's also the a person I mentioned you, called uh, Uat, um, and there's an article that he's written called Interspecies Relations. Uh, international relations, rethinking anthropocentric politics. And I found that this article was a very important read. So I would recommend that highly to anybody who's interested in this subject matter. And of course, going back to that first slide that you saw in terms of the book collage, these are all great um, recommendations in terms of fiction. Other recommendations include the previously mentioned Marrow Thieves by Sherry Dimaline, as well as titles such as The Maze Runner, um, series by James Dashner and the recently uh, released self-described eco-thriller called Hummingbird Salamander by Jeff Vandermeer. Um, and I would be happy to hear more of your suggestions as well. So I just wanted to say thank you once again for everyone for joining me today. I hope you all enjoyed this class. Uh, I do hope some of you will check out my Kofi page um, if you feel so inclined. Um, and now I will take any questions in regards that, uh, to anything that has popped up throughout the course of this class. So thank you again so much.